Right now, I am in Sasfe, Switzerland, staying in an apartment. Um, my wife is attending European graduate school, and so I've got a little bit of vacation time, although I'm doing a lot of work right now. And I thought I would get caught up on some of the backlog of questions that need to be answered from the Q&A video. If you, if you want to ask any questions, by the way, uh, ask them not on this one as a comment, but on the, the one that I've linked to in the description. So I've got 10 more philosophy-related questions lined up, and here they go. Andrew the Red has an interesting question about the history of ideas. For a period of time in the Middle Ages, Aristotle was revered as the philosopher, yet over the last several centuries, and today, that reverence returned to Plato. How and why did Aristotle's prominence change over time? So this is a, there's a, a big complicated story to tell here. I'm going to just sort of hit on some of the main points. Um, working our way backwards, you know, Aristotle and Plato are focused on and read and revered about the same today, at least by people who do, you know, any sort of historically uh, connected or founded philosophy. Um, I wouldn't say that, that Plato has a prominence over him now. And I wouldn't actually say that after the eclipse of Aristotle in the, the late Middle Ages, uh, and the early modern period that it, they were turning to Plato. If you if you look at who people were actually citing and and you know drawing on, interestingly enough, if you wanted to pick an ancient philosopher who was given a much higher status than Plato or Aristotle in the modern period, it would be Cicero. You can see this especially in David Hume, who loves quoting Cicero at length and actually ends up modeling some of his, his works after some of Cicero's works, including the Dialogues on Natural Religion. Now, Aristotle took a while to catch on in the Middle Ages. Uh, it, it, they had some of his, his texts available mainly through, through commentaries, and then, you know, suddenly they're, they're available um, in the High Middle Ages. And then there's this question, what do we do with this guy? Uh, and they were, they were all over the map. There are some people who totally rejected Aristotle. There are other people who were like, you know, Aristotle all the way, the Averroists. And then there were people in the middle like Thomas Aquinas. Um, he was seen as the philosopher because he provided the most systematic way of, of approaching things once you actually had, you know, a good portion of his, his texts. Why did that, that wane? Well, you know, um, there, were, there was too much fundamentalism of Aristotle's works, meaning that people weren't really thinking through them, but they would just cite Aristotle. And this was one of the problems with, with late, not, not middle or early, but late scholasticism. Gerald Sword has an unanswerable question for me. Who would you consider the greatest philosopher of all time by the profundity of their ideas, the, clarity, the rigor of their arguments, clarity and honesty by which they present their ideas, and the influence they've had? Those are a lot of criteria. It might be possible, it might be possible to um, answer with respect to one of those criteria. But even thinking about um, the influence that, that a philosopher has had, you know, I mean, who would we place in those, those realms if we want to think about this historically? Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Cicero, Aquinas, Descartes, Locke. I mean, they're all, you know, they're all great contenders for that. Kant, Hegel, you know, Nietzsche. Um, I don't know. Um, who do I consider the greatest philosopher of time? I don't, I don't have a good answer to that because and you can see this in my work. I, I don't focus just on one guy. I'm torn in a whole bunch of different directions. Uh, there, there are some things that I really love in Plato, although I don't do a lot of writing on him at this point. Um, a lot of things I love in Aristotle. I do do a lot of writing on him. Um, I, I really like Cicero. I think he's under undervalued stock, so to speak, because he, he provides us with, you know, interesting presentations of the, the big heavy hitters of the ancient period. Um, I mean, if we if we fast forward over the, the medievals, which would be a big mistake, but, you know, got to keep this short. Um, if we had to pick, like, of the modern times, that's hard for me to say. 
Um, I mean, you know that I love Hegel, although I'm not a Hegelian. Um, but, you know, there's some other great systematic philosophers. Uh, you know, two phenomenologists come to mind in particular, Max Scheler and Dietrich von Hildenbrand. Um, I also, you know, really like Maurice Blondel for, for that sort of thing as well. Um, and I think part of what I, what I really admire in a philosopher is their ability to take in other people's perspectives and consider them and make them in a certain part their own. That's what dialectics is really about. You know, the best contemporary practitioner of that would be Alistair McIntyre. So Christopher Dunn has a, a question. Could there be a Berkeleyan metaphysics without God? And the, the simple answer is no, and no for two different reasons. One is it wouldn't be Berkeleyan metaphysics in, in a sort of trivial way because Berkeley has God in there, right? And, and so if you're going to take out, you know, an integral part of the system, it's no longer what, what he intended. Um, but you could ask, you know, that question another way and say, okay, I understand that, that Barclay historically actually did have God as, as, you know, central in that. But what if we adopt his perspective on things and then we decide to see if we can, you know, retain what's, what's really valuable in the system while taking God out of the system altogether? And again, the answer to that would be no. Uh, and it wouldn't cease being Berkeley in, in that trivial sense, the whole system would fall apart. And here's, here's why. Um, God, is, God is required in order to hold the entire system of phenomena together. This is, this is why Berkeley, you know, in a certain respect, um, prefigures some, some very interesting, you know, notions about certainty and you know, the ability to, to have something that goes beyond just sort of public uh, agreement or, or perception. Um, the thing is, in Barclay's metaphysics, we have, we have things that appear to us, and, and they don't have matter. Um, they, they are phenomena. And then there are spirits, which are something that is not simply reducible to the phenomena, and we are we are that we're, we're perceivers, and then there there has to be something to hold everything together because you know think of it sort of like um, if everything is really perception, then you're just sort of surrounded by a, you know this penumbra of what it is that you're perceiving, and as soon as you quit perceiving it, it it no longer in any functional way exists. And the only way to hold it together then is to have a whole bunch of other people sort of agreeing with each other with overlapping bands of perception. But then, you know, how do you know that what they're doing is, is actually on track? Maybe they're, you know, totally deceived about things. God is the centerpiece for Barclay. That's part of why he was, you know, making the arguments that he was. Biggie 78 says, The universe is limitless. Men are limited. Therefore, there is no way to know the ultimate truth of the universe. Do you agree? No. Um, and I've got a couple reasons you know, there's first one thing we ought to point out. There's there's different types of limitlessness, and if we're thinking merely in terms of you know like a mathematical plenum and mathematical infinity, yeah, sure, that's fine, but that doesn't mean that we're not able to generalize, uh, because once you've got you know the general ideas down you can apply them successfully. You can say, well, I, I don't know what the hell is going on way over there, and I never will because I can never reach that point. But were I to actually get there, it would, it would have to conform to these sorts of, you know, laws or, or principles or whatever. And, and so, you know, if, you, if you're thinking of if limitlessness in a purely, uh, you know, arithmetic, geom geometric, geometrical, mathematical way, um, then that's not an issue. If, on the other hand, you're thinking beyond that, you say, well, you know, there could always be things that we don't actually uh, know and we can't possibly know them, um, then, the, you know, I, I would actually take a fairly pragmatic um, approach to this and say, well, if they really impact what we know about things, um, you know, then we'd actually know about them. 
they'd have some sort of effect in, in, in our, our existence that we could maybe figure out. Um, if not, then we, you know, we have other, again, we can like focus on, on the general things. It really also depends on what you are calling the ultimate truth of the universe. So if you're going to talk about the ultimate truth of the universe, I don't know how you do that without thinking in terms of, you know, either like a world system or general principles. And it seems like we could come to know them. It could be very difficult. It might require generations to do that. But I don't see why we would be necessarily cut off from it just by being finite. Rob Kneff asks, do you think that Hans Jonas's critique of ethics and religious belief after World War II is still relevant now? His discussion of the responsibilities to society of technology creators and users. Now, Jonas is not somebody who I know an awful lot about. I certainly haven't read you know, my way through all of his works. The one that I've, I've spent the most time on is the Gnostic religion because I, I found it very useful and thought-provoking when I used to teach um, classes having to do with, with the canonical and non-canonical gospels. Um, so, you know, you, gotta, you take this with a, with a grain of salt, right? I'm not, I'm not a Jonas scholar. Um, I understand some of the basic ideas. And so his critique of ethics and religious belief, um, you know, I'm not even quite sure what, what all that means, so I can't comment on that. Uh, but what about his discussion of the responsibilities of society to society of technology creators and users? Okay, that I understand a bit better. And he's got this, this principle or imperative that we should always act in such a way as to... Um, how does he put it? Uh, uh, there we go. So that the effects of your action are compatible with the permanence of genuine human life. Um, that, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I don't think that he is doing something completely original in saying that. I think that you can find, I think you could call that out of context. You could also call that out of Aristotle. You could call that out of Augustine. You could call that out of a lot of uh, moral theorists. It's something that makes a lot of sense. Um, nowadays, we might think of that in terms of this umbrella term of sustainability, um, which is a very nebul nebulous term that requires some clarification. But one part of sustainability is this notion that we, we do have some, we bear some sort of responsibility to not leave things totally screwed up for the people that come after us. So we should be thinking about the effects of, of our, our technology. We think of the, the concomitants of it. Here's a question from Mark Smith. Can you elaborate on the different categories Aristotle proposes, for example, genus, as to what they refer to? So genus isn't a category. Um, the categories properly you know, or in the proper sense, are the predicables, the things that can be said about, about something. And Aristotle gives you a list of, of them. Um, and in, in the metaphysics, by the way, he actually, there's a priority of them as well. You know, in, in the, the categories, you just get substance, usia, and then this, these other, you know, categories as well, and he spends some time discussing them, but he doesn't lay out a, 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 a sort of priority of them. But in the metaphysics, it's substance, uh, quality, topoion, and um, number or quantity, and then the other ones are, are involved. And these are not meant to be um, used in a sort of schematic deductive way, um, it, it's supposed to be something that we can use so that we can understand how we need to distinguish between things. So he might, for example, say good is, is said in many, in many ways. And so good can be, you know, in terms of a quality, it can be in terms of place, it could be in terms of action or, or suffering. It's good qua this. Um, now, genus, uh, species, differentia, all these sorts of things, those are also discussed in, in these logical works of, of Aristotle. Um, and, and they're, you know, they're, they're classes of things that you can put things into. Aristotle believes that 
that um, in some way they exist in the particulars, of course. So I, man, right? Uh, looking at me right now, also male, also um, 40, 40 year old man. Um, the, and then we're getting more and more specific, right? More and more about the species. But there's other 44 year old men out there. Um, so I don't know if this helps out much, but what can you do in two minutes? Mark Smith also asks, could you please explain the distinction between universals and particulars? Um, and I'm going to assume that he means, it, because of the, the context of the other questions, in, in an Aristotelian sense, because, you know, there's, there's different metaphysics out there, and, and a metaphysics is, is connected with, with a logic, uh, a logos, you know, a way of, of understanding the connections between uh, things, or, re, you know, realities, words or, or discourse and thought. Um, actually, a full logic has to extend to action and willing as well, but that's a, <laughs> that's a complicated issue. So universals and particulars. Um, Aristotle thinks that universals don't, strictly speaking, exist or have being um, in the way that you know, real things do. So, again, I'll use myself as an example. Human being, anthropos, right? Um, that exists in me. It's what makes me what I am. And it's a class that we can include you in, assuming you're a human being, you're watching this, um, and all the, all the other human beings that have existed or haven't, ex you know, are, are yet to come. Uh, so long as they fit into a certain set of criteria, have a certain form, a certain you know, uh, structure, they are, are human beings. And they are individual human beings. Um, very often when we're talking about particulars, we mean individuals. Universal in particular can, in fact, be relational terms if we're talking about, you know, being more particular or being more universal because we can have larger and larger categories or groupings that, that we use, classes. Um, but Aristotle thinks that, that this is part of what we're, you know, when, when you see me as man, you're perceiving the universal in the particular, and your mind is taking in that universal, and it in a certain way exists in your, in your mind. So this is an interesting uh, question to ask by Biggie78. I believe that we humans must teach the new generations two subjects, Critical thinking and basic research skills. Do I agree? Uh, yes. I, I would not say those are the, the only two fundamental skills that we, we need to teach them, but I certainly think that those are among the ones that are much more sorely needed and are not being supplied adequately. I think that we ought to have um, not just, you know, vague claims about, you know, that we're doing critical thinking, critical thinking, this is, you, you, you know, if I want to get on my soapbox, critical thinking is one of those things which actually does have a rigorous definition, the different parts of it have been laid out for a long time, and yet we have all these yahoos saying, I'm teaching critical thinking in my classes. And you ask them, what do you mean by critical thinking? And it's some vague thing, or it's, well, I'm teaching people to question something. That's not yet critical thinking. You know, one, for example, one of the components of critical thinking is being able to make arguments and being able to strengthen arguments, um, being able to, to analyze other people's arguments is another one, being able to actually diagram an argument is a critical thinking skill. I think we ought to be teaching that uh, and not leaving it up to the people that are currently teaching, I think we ought to be teaching that K through 12. Um, I think that it should be part of it. And basic research skills, very important in this internet age where the immediate go-to for most people is, is Wikipedia or SparkNotes or something like that. Now, I'm not saying Wikipedia is you know, wrong. As a matter of fact, it's gotten a lot better. But that isn't where you ought to be going. That, you know, research means actually going to as close to the sources as you can get. And we need to teach people how to be able to do that, how to evaluate those. I do think there's a lot of other things that we need as well, but those, you know, if we actually got on the ball with, with those two skills, that would be, that would produce immense social changes. 
So Connor Syrowitz, Cyro, uh, if I mispronounce your name, I'm sorry, says, I've been seeing some philosophical fields such as new materialism and speculative realism, which seem to bring continental sensibilities to subjects which have been overlooked by continental thought. What are your general thoughts in these two fields, and where do you see them heading in the future? So I don't know much about them. You know, I had to actually Google this and see what's meant by these, because whenever you use words like materialism or realism or speculative, in the history of philosophy, these might have meant a ton of different things, and, and people love to coin new uh, terms for what it is that they're doing, and then we see if they, they catch on or not. So as far as I understand, um, yeah, they, they are continental sensibilities. They, they're drawing on, some of them are drawing on some continental thinkers like Badiou. Seems like Altus Air would be somebody that they'd be interested in as well. Um, have these areas been overlooked by, by continental thought? Only if we define continental thought pretty narrowly, and I'm a big enemy of, of that. If, if your definition of continental thought leaves out, for example, Maurice Blondel, Blondel or Gabriel Marcel, or Dietrich von Hildenbrand, or you know Paul Ricoeur, who gets you know cited but not not looked at very closely, then um, I don't I'm not very you know interested. That's why I don't give much credence to the analytic continental split because they're so you know small. Um, I think that you know when it comes to these these issues of like epistemology and how should we should understand the universe and how things come together. I think continentals have been talking about that. I think that they've been focused a lot more on on social reality, which is fine. Um, where is this stuff going? I don't know. I don't know enough about about the thinkers that are you know at the center of what looks like it could be a movement to really have much of an informed opinion. And since I don't have an informed opinion, I probably shouldn't have too much of an opinion. This is a really tough question by Mark Smith, one that I, I, I have to admit I don't have an answer for, because right? I've got too many answers. What is your favorite non-philosophical book and why do you enjoy it? So I have, you know, I've, I've thought about this a number of different times since being asked this question. What is my favorite non-philosophical book? Um, and I can land on ones that I particularly like, but they're not my favorite in the sense that they're above all the others. Um, I can tell you about the stuff I like to, to read that's not directly philosophical, but some, oftentimes has a lot of philosophy in it. Um, I, I have a real interest in some of these 20th century uh, British writers who often are you know struggling with their religious sensibilities, um, like Graham Greene, uh, Evelyn Waugh, Iris Murdoch. Um, I would actually like you know be willing to migrate Flannery O'Connor in there. There's a depth to their to their thought and their their writings and a receptiveness to being able to sort of let the characters do what they're going to do and and not try to you know dogmatize about it. That I really I really love about their works. Um, I also really like, you know, science fiction, and there are some authors that I will go back to the rest of my life, and they tend to be of two sorts. No, of three sorts, really. One would be the just absolutely brilliant, great storytelling, but very philosophical writers like um, Philip K. Dick and A. E. Van Voigt. Um, you know, there, there's some others that, that could fit in there, you know, Rogers Lasney with the Amber Chronicles, because, you know, the, the world of Amber is essentially a Neoplatonist construct and things like that. And then I, I really also do like the, you know, what's called the new, new wave of science fiction. It's pretty old. It came about in the 60s and 70s. And I mentioned Zelazny, Moorcock, Farmer, Le Guin, uh, people like that. Um, and then I like the, the sort of world designer, you know, a million different plots going on at the same time. People like George R. Martin, you know, with the Game of Thrones. Uh, uh, supposed to be seven books. It's, he's up to book five. Um, the Dune, the early Dune stuff is really good um, for the same sorts of reasons. 
Um, who else would fall into that category? I don't know. Um, another another author. I realize I'm going way past the two two minute mark with this too. But you notice that talking about books, you can go on forever. Another author who I really really love, uh, and I'm almost you know tempted to learn Spanish just so I can read in the original, would be um, Jorge Luis Borges. But again, you know, a lot of philosophical themes, a lot of playing with philosophy going on in his works. So I've already gone on quite you know, quite too long with this. I'm making an exception in this case, uh, but I should cut this short now, and so I'll just leave it at that.